This episode of the Flush Podcast is brought to you by our partners in the field, Federal Premium Ammunition, Benelli Shotguns, and Carlson's Choke Tubes. Together, they provide a one, two, three punch that we take with us on every hunt in the field. Today, we're going to do our best to move past all of this COVID-19 talk to take a mental break and discuss do-it-yourself bird hunting options across North America. And I've brought one of my favorite bird hunting buddies, George Lyle, onto the show to lend us his wisdom. And he has plenty of ideas to share. Welcome to another episode of the Flush Podcast. I believe we are on episode 12, and my name is Travis Frank. I am your host, as always. Thank you for joining us today. Like I said in the introduction, we're going to do our best to move past this COVID-19 talk and just kind of take a mental break. I think we all could use a little bit of a break. Today, George Lyle joins me. George, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Travis. We would have had this show out probably yesterday, but it took you almost a full 24 hours to get digitally connected here so we can talk. (laughs) Well, that's what happens when you take a dog trainer and try and get him on the computer. (laughs) Ah, Well, I'm glad that you've taken the time today. You and I have spent a lot of time in the field, and, you know, when I go places, everybody wants to everybody wants to talk about George Lyle. You know, so we produce several different TV shows and I feel like I'm always disappointing people when I show up because if I'm filming for Minnesota Bound or Do North Outdoors and I show up, they say, oh, I was hoping Laura would come, Laura Shara. So I'm always disappointing people there. And then when I go places in the bird hunting world, they always want to talk about George Lyle, George Lyle, my buddy George. So I thought it's due time that we sit down together and uh, talk about what we enjoy talking about the most, bird hunting, buddy. Well, you and I have been on a lot of ventures together, and um, Mm -hmm. there's nothing I like more than uh, being out in the field with you and uh, our bird dogs and watching the bird dogs run and the adventures uh, those dogs take us on. Because without the dogs, the adventure is kind of lost with me. So, Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. One of the things that I've really appreciated over the last, oh gosh, we've been hunting together for a few years now, but just the fact that we we do like this that we're doing right now. We just kind of talk to each other on the phone and say, what should we do next? Where should we go? And you and I pretty much always just do it on our own, which that's how I grew up hunting. You and I, we hunt the same. And that's why it's so much fun because we will literally just drive into the middle of nowhere and get out of the truck or get out of the boat or whatever vehicle we chose to get us into a place. And we'll just start hunting. And we usually always do it on public land too. So today we're going to break down some do-it-yourself bucket list bird hunting ideas. So when this whole COVID crisis passes, uh, we can do what we love to do, which is get back out into the field. And maybe you can put some of these ideas to use this this coming hunting season. Uh, Before though, George, before we get into that, I got a couple of housekeeping items I want to throw out there to our listeners. Um, We we have been producing television, uh, oh gosh, more than 15 years now. In just the last few years, we've been streaming our episodes on YouTube. Um, we have a flush YouTube channel. And so we thought, gosh, we have, we've got archives. We've got classic episodes that are not online right now. And so uh, I've got a couple of editors actually right now that are – they're basically pulling out all of these classic shows out of the archives. We're going to start. Um, we're going to start posting, streaming some of those old shows just to give people some more content right now. Um, we'll probably be doing one a week, and that'll lead us up into our new season of episodes that'll be airing on the Outdoor Channel. So. If you are looking for some more bird hunting content, follow or subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, Flush YouTube channel. And you are going to be getting 
more content starting this week. Uh, secondly, George, you know this. Uh, you live in Minnesota, so you know that we produce other television shows as well. Uh, Minnesota Bound and Do North Outdoors are a couple of them that I uh, I work on and produce, just like I do with The Flush. And like a lot of people right now, I have been basically trying to figure out what can I do to help right now? I mean, we're obviously in this together, this, this whole world right now. Um, and so a couple weeks ago, I thought, well, we can raise money for our healthcare workers. And so um, Minnesota's fishing opener is Saturday, uh, May 9th, coming up. And so we will be announcing this uh, on a lot of our other television shows, but I thought I'd throw it out there too, and you don't know this yet, George, but we are going to be doing a digital fishing contest. There's an app out there that allows us to do this. So people can go, if you're going fishing on the fishing opener this year, you can fish with a purpose now because we are doing, it, the event is called Fishing for Our Front Lines, and we are gonna be raising money for our healthcare workers. This is gonna help them with uh, PPE items, uh, things that they need right now to help protect us. And so basically, we've partnered with the U of M. They have a emergency caregivers fund that's been set up. And so we've got that fund connected to the app. It's called the Fish Donkey app. And basically, you go on, the, on your phone, you download the app, you join our event. It's a $20 donation. And we have several thousand dollars in prizes. We've got some really generous uh, partners that have joined us in, in hoping to raise money for our healthcare workers. But uh, it's going to be on Saturday, May 9th. We are going to be launching it this week on a lot of our other Minnesota Bound, Do North Outdoors. You'll probably be seeing it in several places. But we hope you'll join us. If you plan on fishing in Minnesota, and I know that the flush, you know, we're a national, uh, we're a national show, but this, this is Minnesota based because that's where we're based out of, and and we have a chance to do something here, and we hope that you'll you'll join us. So if you're going fishing, George, maybe even you can jump you can jump in on the fishing opener um, and help us raise some money for those that are working so hard right now on the front lines to protect us. So again, fish donkey app on your phone, you can socially. Uh, distance yourself and fish and be a part of this event um, and we have some really tremendous prizes uh, that we're going to be giving away and we're raising a lot of money hopefully so anyway those are the housekeeping items George any thoughts on that sounds like I better get on and uh, join in in the um, in the efforts well the we'd love to have you too. we'd love to have you it um, I don't know. I just like I have friends, I have family that right now they're going to work and a lot of us are being told don't go to work. And a lot of us are saying, you know, keep your distance. And yet they don't have the choice. They're there fighting. They're working hard. And we just, oh, man, I'm just like my heart's going out to them. And I just want to help. And so I feel like this is a way to do it. We've connected. Uh, a, we've connected enough dots to make this happen. Um, and you know we've we've we're, we're basically how it's going to work is like you take you take a photo of the fish laying on your on your tape measure, uh, your measuring device, and the largest the longest walleye, longest northern pike, longest largemouth bass, longest smallmouth bass, they're all going to win. Um, uh, we've got like these fishing gear packs, uh, great value to them, and then the grand prize. I'm going to pick a secret secret length of a fish, and the first person to catch a fish that lands on the secret length that nobody's going to know about but me. And uh, maybe I'll have to disclose it to somebody else for legal rights. But anyway, um, once somebody lands on that, it's a it's like a $3,000 um, fishing trip giveaway for four buddies up to Lake of the Woods, plus um, gift cards to Fleet Farm and uh, gear pack from Rapala, rod and reel combos, things like that, things like that that we're giving away. So anyway. Sorry, I've taken a lot of time. Uh, George, let's get into, uh, let's talk bird hunting, buddy. You cool with that? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, George, who introduced you to bird hunting right off the bat? I gotta, let's go back a few years. Well, that is a few years back. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Because I've been bird hunting probably since I've been about four or five years old. 
in uh, northern Minnesota. So that would be my uh, my dad and my uh, and my grandparents. What'd you guys uh, hunt? Uh, my first upland bird hunt was uh, rough grouse. Let me guess, the bird got away. <laughs> well, possibly. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're keeping track of all our misses. That's a yeah. long, long story. Yeah. Do you uh, remember yeah, it, first, though? I remember my first uh, rough grouse flush like it was yesterday. Really? Um, Tell me about it. And, and yeah, when you're seven years old and the bird flies, you're bound to miss. And I did miss my first um, grouse flush. Uh, but uh, my dad was there, and I could take you to the exact spot in the woods. Uh, and um, I'm sure the trees have changed, but because, uh, like I said, it was a long time ago. But I definitely could take you to the exact spot where uh, where my dad took me and uh, the first uh, – First on the wing uh, shot at a rough grouse. Um, all my grouse were shot on the wing, by the way. But even as a young kid, I never, uh, we never shot them out of trees. So you sure um, are a Spartan, a Spartan fellow there, Georgie. Yeah, I did remember you know, my. Did you, know, did you know in our ventures in Canada, some of those birds uh, tend to just stare at you? So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right they do yeah. i remember my first uh rough grouse flush i was actually following my dad to his deer stand i wasn't old enough to deer hunt at the time but um i just wanted to hunt my gosh that's all i wanted to do so i went with him to the deer stand and we're walking through the woods in the dark and we scared a, a rough grouse and i oh my gosh like it it like knocked me backwards. I didn't quite step on it, but it was close. And that explosion was just in the dark. You know how loud they are in, in the light from a distance, but only, a, you know, a couple of feet in front of me. I just like, what the heck was that? You know, it just, you can't forget that. You just can't. No. Um, it, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Trev. Oh, I was going to say, if, if you could only hunt one bird, would it be the rough grouse? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's the king of the upland game birds, and there's no doubt about it. And I'd argue to the sun went down and came back up again with anybody that's a bird hunter. Uh, they're a very humbling bird. Um, you know, you go in with a brace of dogs, and they're on point, and one's back in the other, and you are in total anticipation of that flush. And you know the bird's coming right off that dog's nose, and you know it's going to happen. And somehow, some way, they still twist you in a knot a lot of times. So uh, when you when you hold a rough grouse in your hand after successful uh, bird dog work, and uh, it, it, as you know, it's just um, it's really cool. It is. It is. I mean, there's really there's two ways that people hunt for rough grouse, in my opinion. One is with a dog and you take them on the wing. The second is you either drive a trail with your four-wheeler or walk a trail and you're you're not bringing a dog and if you have a shot at them on the ground or in a tree, you take them that way. And it seems to me that a lot of times when you see photos of people that have a pile of grouse laying in front of them, like they shoot their limit, most likely they're doing it the second way. It's a very challenging uh, hunt to take them on the wing pointing you know with a point and dog um and my gosh as i've learned now trying to do it with a television camera in the woods or multiple cameras getting <laughs> capturing that on camera is one of the most challenging things i've ever been a part of in outdoor television yeah i've, um, I've been there i've been there side by side with you um I mean, I, I, I've been in the grouse woods since, like I said, I've been four or five years old, not carrying a gun when I was four or five, but mm -hmm. uh, but by the time I was seven. Um, but I've been in the grouse woods the majority of my life. Um, and, you know, whether you have a dog or not, and you're, and you're walking, flushing them up, or, you know, a flushing dog or a punting dog, whichever, Mm -hmm. It is a very humbling bird, and now you add uh, the, the, t the you know the camera guys there with us, which we've done many times together. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, 
to get the bird on on film and get the whole scene, you know, I, I would say set, but you can't you you can't set it up. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Right. You, you, right. Uh, these are wild birds, and um, they do what they will do, and that is uh, survive most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I think there's a reason why there's two bird hunting shows that you don't see a lot of, and one is rough grouse and the other is chucker. <laughs> it's just because of the challenges that uh, come with trying to actually make the camera see what the hunter sees. It's so tough to be in the right position because it's almost always so thick. They very rarely flush in a place where it's there's an opening, um, rough grouse anyway, um, and then chucker. Obviously, it's just you know lugging a camera six thousand feet up a mountain and up and down, up and down. Uh, but we still do our best to try. And George, we've we've done uh, Ontario. We've hunted together. Uh, we've hunted in Oklahoma together for bobwhite quail. We've hunted in Wyoming for chucker. Uh, sage grouse, Hungarian partridge, and I'm already looking forward to our next journey. But I have to imagine there's other hunters listening right now that are looking forward to the same. So why don't we break down a few of our hunts together? Let's start with our grouse hunt in Ontario. Um, we hunted on public land. George, how long ago was that when we went up there? Was that five years ago? Um, I, I believe it was four or five years ago. Yep. Four or five years ago. Okay. So, um, basically it, I mean, so when you get up into Ontario, we, we went out on Lake of the Woods and we stayed at, uh, it's called the French Portage Outpost Camp. And basically it's just this little cabin sitting on an island. Um, and it's about... A 45-minute boat ride, maybe 50-minute boat ride in, um, and it's pretty rustic. They did they have running water there? Yeah, we had running water and and hot water, which was a dream. Yeah, yeah. we didn't have our bathroom was a hole in the ground, um, yeah. and then there was an outhouse. But yeah, that's right. We did have running water. Um, and they did have a satellite dish on top, so we did have television. Uh, in the fall, we were able to watch the Vikings game. I do remember that. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so we're on an island, and now when you get up into on Lake of the Woods, most of the islands are called Crown Land. So this is basically America's version of public land. And so our idea going into it, George and I, we, you and I, we we studied a, quite a few maps. But we really went into it blind, thinking, well, we're going to look for, you know, islands that have burnt recently uh, because, you know, you get up into that remote country, forest fires still happen up there uh, regularly. And so we were looking for that kind of cover. But really, the idea was, OK, we're bringing the dogs. I've got a boat. George, you brought Tucker and Boone. Uh, you didn't have many back then, right? Um, mm. And so... We're like, let's let's just go see what we can see. Uh, we found that basically, um, well, it, so we ended up making two episodes out of out of this adventure, um, and you can watch them. They're they're on our YouTube channel. You can stream them. But um, basically, we made two full episodes out of it because we found that there was so much untouched game to be had up there. Once we got into this wilderness, one, uh, did we see anybody else? I don't remember. Did we even see any other boats? We might have seen a boat or two drive by, but they were fishing. We never saw any other hunters, right? Correct. Um, we hunted a lot. We spent a lot of time just on the island that our cabin was on because there were so many birds there. But essentially, we could have just pulled up and hunted anywhere, right? <clears throat> Yeah, you know, like you said, we were looking for these islands range in, you know, I don't know, Travis, you know, 15 acres to what, 80 acres, hundreds yeah, of acres? Hundreds of acres, um, they're all so, different, yeah. Yeah, so 
you know, just I mean, it's rough grouse hunting. You got to find the habitat. They they got to be in the right habitat, or you're not going to find them at all. So that's what we, you know, that's what you and I were doing is finding what island had the habitat that we thought would would have uh, grouse on it. So, mm. and those forest you- fires on those islands provide, you know, it's Mother Nature's way of a, of a clear cut. Uh, right. so they bring that early successional forest in and these islands aren't spread out that far. I mean, some are, the water's only a couple hundred yards across. So these birds are going to move from island to island as the habitat, uh, you know, dictates the, um, the food source that they need. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> there's one thing that really, really stood out to me, uh, on that hunt, but I'm going to ask you what. What stood out the most to you? Um, as far as the rough grouse side mm-hmm. of things, mm-hmm. was you know earlier in this you, you talked about two ways to hunt rough grouse. One is to walk a trail, and the other is to get off the beaten path. Uh, on the crown lands, there are no trails. Oh, we? <laughs> you know, and when you're in the middle of the lake, there are no paths. So uh, thick, thick cover. Uh, you know, besides having your normal hunting equipment, well, every part of my normal hunting equipment is a is a compass. So you better have a compass and know what direction you're going and, and how to find your way back to the boat. So no trails. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yep. Can I tell you what stood out to me the most? <laughs> yeah. Just how stupid those birds were. They were oh. so dumb. They, when, when, when Boone went on point the first time, that grouse looked at that dog like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> it had no idea what a dog was. It had never seen a dog before. I'm positive. It had no idea that it should be afraid of that dog. It didn't know what to do about that dog. And Boone was, I remember very specifically looking at Boone, just rock solid point. And he is staring at this grouse that is not 10 feet from him wide open, standing on a log, looking right at him. And then the grouse just kind of does this little like, I'm going to go ahead and start walking this way and just starts walking away from the dog. He didn't want to flush. We chased it probably 70 yards, George, maybe, maybe more before oh. we got that bird to get off, <laughs> off the ground. It was, um, it was, it was darn near comical. That is for sure. That, you know, uh, Again, you you know you rem- remember those things like they were yesterday, and uh, I'm sure you and I could almost take the same path that the bird the bird really took us on the path. Uh, yep. But Boone Boone led us down that path because the bird you know remember how f- the bird was right in front of us, then we couldn't find him, and yep. uh, he, it was so thick. You're like, where did the bird go, and why is he not flushing? And I would release Boone, and Boone would go about. 30 yards or not even and lock back up on point we make our way there and and we could see him again that bird taunted us for quite a while and uh you know you mentioned trying to get a flush on camera in the grouse woods and if my memory serves me correct if if folks go back and watch the youtube uh show on that they'll see the flush well one they'll see the dog work they'll see the flush and bird in hand and uh uh you know cameraman got it all on film which i was extremely impressed because just carrying the camera through that brush would have been hard hard enough let alone get it on film right right i i give all the credit to our cameraman for being there uh logging those cameras around i mean they're roughly a 30 pound camera um you know on their shoulder through all that cover it's hard enough to just try to get through it on your own carrying a shotgun but the stuff that they carry through all the batteries and everything and then man somehow they they get it i think they take as much pride in getting it on camera as we do trying to take that bird out of the air with our shotguns but um yeah there there were a lot of birds on those islands i think you know if we would have ventured to every island uh we probably would have found birds on every single one of them don't you think I, I agree. Absolutely. And the the opportunities, well, that was about four or five, 
what do we say, four or five years ago, we'd still be there, Travis. That's right. how many islands are there. The, you know, the birds up there, like you said, I guarantee you those birds live their life never seeing a dog. Yep. Um, you know, not seeing a hunter, anything. Yeah. Yeah. They would jump up in trees and stare at us like, what are you guys doing here? And they just didn't have fear in them. They just didn't know what to do about it. Yeah. So if, if, if there's, you know, when people say like, hey, where would you go if you were going to go on a grouse hunt? I tell them it's a little bit of an adventure, but if you have a boat and you're you're willing to rough it, um, it's so, so cool. So Lake of the Woods that time of the year, um, one morning, I, I think I threw two dozen duck decoys in, in the boat as well. And so one morning on the backside of our island, um, Costi Island is the one that we stayed on. That's the one where French Portage is. But on the backside of that island is a giant bay full of rice. And so we're like, well, we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll throw some decoys out and you brought your over under out there. And, uh, I brought some, uh, steel shot, duck loads and uh scott and and his buddy uh brad they joined us so there was four of us scott franzen and brad hamilton <clears throat> and so we gosh we shot our limit of ducks is like way faster than any of us thought we would ever take our limit of ducks uh geese came in and we're just like this this land is just so fruitful and there's nobody else out here um any any comments on, from your end on that duck hunt? Um, so when you throw duck hunting in there, I, I, all I can say is the whole trip was, I hate to use the word, but I'm going to use the word epic. Yeah. Um, like you said, we, you know, we, we put a lot of, <clears throat> we brought a lot of equipment on that hunt to try well, duck hunting, rough grouse hunting. We had our fishing rods, but when we got on the backside of that island and, and uh, you guys put the decoys out and we got hunkered down, the amount of ducks that came into us, um, it, it was just fantastic. And in the, in the the scene, the scenery, and the um, the position we were in in that in that little bay, I'll never I'll never forget it. Mm. I'll never forget it, and um, um, just the ducks working. Travis, that day, we got up in the morning, we went out there in the dark, set the decoys out, shot ducks, shot geese. Uh, Scott's Labradors did awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Izzy, uh, rest in peace. She yep. did awesome. Then we went. And caught walleyes off the dock and out <laughs> yeah. of the boat and then we went grouse hunting so that day that duck hunt was awesome it was i remember we're in our camouflage we got back to the to the cabin and we said let's go see if we can catch a fish off the dock just for just for poops and giggles in the cam we had two cameramen with and they're like oh we'll go film it and our plan was to go out in a boat <clears throat> or go out in our boats and walleye fish so we could have a, you know, like the, the surf version of our surf portion of our surf and turf. But we got to the dock and I remember you, me, Brad, we all casted our line out and Scott was still tying his jig and we had a competition. Last person to catch a fish has to clean the, clean the fish or the birds or whatever it was. But we all set the hook on a walleye on our first cast. We're like, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. We caught smallmouth bass, northern pike, walleye, perch. What else? I think we caught something else too off the dock. But there were so many fish that we never actually untied the boat and we caught our meal of walleyes too. So I've told that story to my some of my other hunting buddies. I'm like, guys, if you ever want to do like the ultimate fall fishing hunting adventure, my goodness, I I don't know if you can beat what we experienced up there. I really don't. I mean, the variety, the amount of birds. Um, we went maybe 150 yards behind the cabin before we had our first point on a grouse. Was it any further than that? It couldn't have been, George. No, it wasn't any farther than that. And they were yeah. everywhere. They were everywhere back there. 
They were. They were. The only thing that hampered us was on that particular shoot, we had rain and wind, and our, we lost one camera from the moisture, from the rain. We broke a camera. Scott, the owner of our company, he wasn't happy about that, so he had to postpone some of the filming and the conditions. I would have normally pushed on probably, but uh, we obviously want to be, you know, aware of the expensive equipment we're taking into those conditions. But uh, high on the list, we stayed in, um, like I said, we stayed at the French Outpost Camp, which is part of Totem Resorts. Um, it sleeps in that particular camp. I want to say you could sleep a dozen people probably. It was, Maybe. it was a lot. Yeah. yeah. Was, yep. I mean, not, um, that I, not that I want to go with a dozen people grouse hunting, but if you had, you know, there's four of us, we had two boats. I mean, if you showed up with six guys, if ever, if, if you hunted in pairs, which I highly recommend up there, never, I wouldn't go up in that territory alone um you know we there are no roads so right right um, but yeah you could have a group of guys and, and uh or gals and go out and island hop and and fish and hunt and everything yeah i recommend don't go up there without bringing a, a, a dozen or two duck decoys because those birds are uh thick uh, you need to find us some rice. It didn't take a lot of work. Basically, none of us had ever gone up there, so we didn't have a guide. We did it all by just using our our uh, mountain men senses. Uh, but basically, you drive around for a little bit. You find rice sticking out of the water. You see the ducks. You say, let's set up there in the morning and see what happens. Uh, very simple. Uh, there's not a lot of pressure. Uh, I've talked to some of the locals since then, and they say, oh, man, our duck hunting up here is one of the best kept secrets that this lake, this region has. Um, we were up there late September. Um, the duck season, waterfowl season opens up in Ontario, I want to say early September. So you can extend your hunting season by going up there earlier in the year. Um, <laughs> there's just so many options, really. And now we didn't look into pitching a tent because we we found this cabin. I think there's probably other cabins, outpost camps, you might be able to rent if you want to pursue something like this. But uh, if you wanted to really save some money and bring a tent, again, it's crown land. That's Canada's version of public land. You'd have to do a little bit of research on, on making sure you can camp. But um, man, if you really wanted to rough it, go with Boundary Waters style and, and uh, camp. I really think that's that's an option, George. Out of t out of a uh, one through ten for your your bucket list do-it-yourself bird hunts, where would you rank the Ontario adventure? I knew you were going to ask this, but <laughs> we've been on so many adventures together and and lots of hunting and fishing trips. But um, oh boy, I'll just put it on a on a one to ten. It's a nine or ten, Travis. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I would agree. Okay, let's shift gears. Well, let's yeah. head south. Let's head south. So you turned me on to this one. I want to say four years ago. Uh, it was a public land quail hunt. And what sparked your interest in going to Oklahoma in the first place? Uh, well, the bird itself, uh, quail is something that i've hunted um i would say when i was a lot younger more on you know you come across them on accident in iowa uh, i've done a fair amount of upland bird hunting in the state of iowa i've been well i've been in a lot of states but nebraska hunting other game birds and then you come across uh the mighty little bobway quail um they kind of remind me of smallmouth bass how they uh the tenacity they have for life. So uh, when they flush, they are little they are little bombs coming out of that cover. Um, I equate that to the to the smallmouth bass because of how how hard they fight. But anyway, I wanted to go I wanted to go where quail were plentiful and the dogs could just get out and move and um, you know search and locate uh, lots of cubbies of quail and so i put a pin uh on the on the great state of oklahoma 
and the opportunities they have uh, for public hunting. And um, I got in the truck and I just headed southwest until I found the right cover. And and literally that's what I did. I, I, I did more research than that. I made some phone calls. I talked to game bird biologists, fish and parks down there and pulled up the maps of larger public areas and uh, and made some phone calls to some hotels. So I knew I had a place to stay. Um, and I just, like I said, I pointed the nose of the truck Southwest and uh, what, 14, 16 hours later, there I was. Uh, so uh, who did you call? I mean, you just did a little, uh, you know, research on quail or like, for somebody who's never done it, tell them what's what are you, what's your steps that you take. Well, uh, one step I take is um, you know every year, Quail Forever Pheasants Forever puts out the um, Upland Bird Hunting Super Issue. There's a lot of good articles in there. I found uh, I found some articles in there that that talked about Oklahoma. I reached out to. Uh, some folks at Quail Forever to talk to them about quail hunting in Oklahoma. And they gave me some insights and some direction. And uh, best of all, I called the uh, Game Fish and Parks in Oklahoma and found the bird biologist um, for the Western region of Oklahoma and had a conversation with, with, uh, with him. And then from there, I talked to the, some folks that were uh, directly managed uh, these public areas in Oklahoma and I've done it in Kansas um, the resources there these are these are um, you know these are the, the folks that have feet on the ground that are in the field year-round they'll give you some great insight uh, to the point where I've had folks tell me you know George this this year you might want to look at a different state They've gone to that extreme, you know. They they still want your uh, hunting and fishing dollars. Uh, the small town restaurant and hotel operators want want you to come stay there, but all these folks are going to be extremely honest with you and say whether or not uh, they've had a drought that year or, or what whatever the weather conditions and bird populations are, they're going to steer you in the right direction. So you know if you're if you're making a twelve hour to fifteen hour trip. Look at multiple states and, and multiple, some of these states are, are huge. I mean, the right. difference between eastern Kansas and western Kansas is night and day. The difference between, same thing, eastern Oklahoma, western Oklahoma, Texas, wherever you might be going, um, South Dakota, uh, whatever. You know, yep. Reach out to these folks and figure out what has happened and do it throughout the, starting now, you can start making phone calls to see what the winter, what was their winter like? Uh, and then they might've had a lot of snow. So, you know, it's starting to green up and, and during the hatch, they have a great spring. And all of a sudden, especially in States like Oklahoma, you hit the middle of summer and they get blasted with 120 degree temps all day and everything bakes off. And if they haven't had the moisture, then those, then those quail are just going to, they're just not going to survive. So you got to you got to find where in the state they've had the right habitat come up, and these folks will tell you. Do you ever find that um, somebody might be withholding information, or do you are you getting pretty good, honest uh, info from them? I I feel like I'm getting very honest information from them. now. If you call me, <laughs> I might lead you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> You know, that, that's the difference. <clears throat> when you call a game bird biologist, they're going to yep. give you they're going to give you 100 percent accurate information as best as they know. Uh, again, they're they're working in their areas and their districts, and they're going to give you the honest, straight truth. If you call someone's cousin's sister, she might have the greatest quail hunting in Oklahoma. But she's got bird dogs, and she wants to keep those cubbies for herself, so she might lead you in a different direction. Right, so right. I'd have, I, would, I just would say have multiple resources. 
Right. I, I, that's that's my advice too. Is is always make multiple phone calls when when I'm so in this position of you know setting up uh, hunts that we're going to film television shows for. People always want to tell me about their greatest hunts they've ever had and how good it can be. But the reality is they might have 10 terrible ones to have that one good one. And I have to be able to decipher what is most likely going to happen while I am there. Because we have wild birds, we have weather factors, and so many variables that need to go into play uh, in a short amount of time. And I have to leave with the television show. So I am always checking multiple uh, sources in an area and a lot of times I hear the same thing from other people then obviously I know yep I that's a very reliable uh, source and this person says the same thing too but yeah people people as a general rule um, you know like you said your cousin's sister's brother's buddy he might want that for himself but the people that are managing the land um, that want to you know want to grow the sport and make it special for everybody they're gonna they're gonna give you the right information they may not say here is exactly the hillside that a covey lives on but they're gonna say you know they're out there they're out there and you can you can find them too yeah we we went uh when did we go down there george was it the first week of january it was the first it was the first week of january and uh, uh you know will you ever forget leaving my farm here in minnesota <laughs> It was a white owl blizzard. No, how could I? It was about uh, well, with the wind chill, I'm sure it was about forty some below zero, and we could barely see the hood of the truck when we pulled out of the farm here in Southwest Minnesota. And uh, you know, I think um, we had your cameraman in the back seat, and he's like, "Fellas, should we really be leaving?" I said, "Trust me, <laughs> we're go we're going." And uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, we fought the snow, I don't know, through pretty far down there. Um, yeah. But uh, but we got out of it, and we had, once we hit Oklahoma, once we got down through Kansas and in Oklahoma, we had great weather. And, and uh, you know, Travis, you reminded me of something about, you know, folks say, oh, you got to come down here and hunt. I got some great great spots to take you and the birds are plentiful and uh, sometimes you get there and it, and it just doesn't doesn't pan out and I will tell you that when we left in January some friends of mine were down there in December literally I think a week and a half before we before we left here and they came back and said oh I don't know if I would go and I'm like, really? Well, we're going because I, you know, we'd done our research and we knew the birds were there, yep. and they just didn't really have the greatest luck. Um, you, you could count a lot of factors in there, and I'll and I'll probably touch on one about public public hunting. Mm -hmm. um, but you and I had an outstanding trip, and and folks go on there and look and watch the the flush show in Oklahoma. I mean that one. What did we hunt? Three days. Um. Yes. Yes, we did. We hunted with uh, Jonathan, uh, a guy that you met, uh, because you you basically sewed up his dog in the field, right? The year before. Yep. Correct. A couple years before that, but yeah. Okay. Jonathan. Uh, what was his last name again? Jonathan Pfeiffer. Jonathan Pfeiffer. That's right. That's right. Yep. So what, how did you meet him again? What a great guy. Um, yeah. So it was it was two years, I believe, before you and I went down there to uh, film, or a year before we went down there to film The Flush. And I was um, hunting with a buddy of mine, and his dog got uh, tore up by a barbed wire fence. And so I was had him in the hotel room. The weather was nice. Hotel room door was open. There's a motel, so you know we're all on ground level. The door was open, and I had the dog up on a table, and I was stitching the dog back together and cleaning my buddy's dog up. And and um, Jonathan walks by with a couple of his buddies, and they stop in the doorway, and they're like, "What's you know?" They just started talking to us, and and uh, they see me stitching this dog back together, and Jonathan's like, "Gosh, my dog has the same problem. Would you take a look at my dog?" So I'm like, sure, bring him in. And, and um, 
I uh, I was able to stitch his dog back together. And from there, you know, in a hotel room in uh, Western Oklahoma, uh, we formed a friendship that's, geez, five, six, at least six or seven years old now. We talk probably once a month. And um, it's just funny how you uh, you meet people and you be you become friends. Mm-hmm. And uh, our friendship was formed over a uh, dog that was in uh, a little bit of rough shape, and and um, but we got him back in the field, so that was uh, pretty awesome. And and from that, you talk about how do you find places? Well, a lot of it's word of mouth, right? Mm-hmm. And building those friendships when you're on the road, you might meet someone in a restaurant, you might see some other hunters, uh, especially in public hunting grounds, you pull up, you have this whole place all set up to go hunt. You pull in there and there's already a rig there mm-hmm. and maybe they're, they're getting their dogs ready and you stop and talk to them and, and maybe you form a friendship over that as you hopefully on public ground, you move on to the next spot and let those fellas and gals hunt that spot and not trample over each other. But Jonathan and I have a great friendship now. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, the, the upland bird hunting is such a social sport too, and it, it certainly is better when people are, you know, talking to each other about game plans, especially, you know, we, you and I hunt a lot of public lands. Our friendship really started, we met at Pheasant Fest many years ago, and we ended up having dinner. And I think just like the stories you were telling me, and then I would tell you my stories, like we just both live for the exact same thing. It's like, let's go find our next adventure and doing it on our own. I mean, that's what I thrive off of. And obviously you do the same too, which is what makes it so much fun to just like, find these places, talk about them, plan, and make it happen. I mean, and I remember you saying, I got this buddy of mine down there, and he said, hey, why don't you stay at our at our uh, camp, or deer camp, or cabin, or what, I don't know, it was in the middle of the open prairie down there in Oklahoma, and so we, yeah, we drove down in January, left the blizzard in Minnesota, we got down there at like midnight, probably. Yeah, it was a long it's a long ride down there and it uh in the in the cover of darkness we pulled into north central oklahoma to his uh his cabin which middle of nowhere right travis mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. lots of wide open spaces but yeah. uh, um i think the neat thing about about that trip is uh we 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 had some spots. We went to some different areas that certainly neither one of us had been to. You've never been to Oklahoma, I think, before that. Correct. And to, um, you know, like you said, we're both like-minded people, and and to study the habitat, the terrain. Uh, you know, I equate when you when you are when you pull into wide open spaces. To me, it's like when you pull your boat onto the lake and you have all the fishing electronics and, you you know, you got the lake maps on there and mm-hmm. you just don't pull out in the middle of the lake and cast your, cast your line out there. You have to study what's presented to you. And um, I think you and I complement each other both very well in the upland uh, fields and looking at the terrain and the habitat and going... I don't think there's birds over there, but look at that spot. I bet you there's birds there. And how many times have we done that together? And we, you know, the dogs go with us, but they're out there hunting. And lo and behold, there they are. I want to say that one of those days in Oklahoma, we had over 20, 22 to 24 coveys found Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on public ground and uh which if anyone knows quail hunting that's an epic day on uh on public hunting. <laughs> yeah it was i i do remember jonathan invited us to hunt some of his deer hunting properties like oh yeah we got quail too but uh which we did we did find some but the thing that really stood out to me was we we had five times more success on the public ground than we did on the private ground which is usually the other way around but again yeah i it doesn't matter. Like I grew up hunting and fishing for everything that I could hunt and fish for. And to me, I just like, 
I am a creature of detail. Like I am watching everything that's happening. Nothing in the wild world seems to happen by chance, whether it's upland birds, big game. There's a reason they are where they are. And so I am always paying attention. I am always watching. And I feel like the first morning I get to a place, especially, you know, since we do a lot of these adventures where we've never been, the first half a day, I'm really just like, I'm watching what the dogs do. I'm watching where they go. I'm looking at the habitat. If something explodes from a certain kind of cover, I'm making a note of it. Where is there other pieces that look like it? Uh, where do people most likely hunt when they come here? How do we get it further away? Um, how do we get somewhere where the birds might have been pushed into, might congregate? Water sources, food sources, nest, uh, 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 a roosting cover, you know, things like that. That's what. That's what is constantly going through my mind, as well as keeping in touch with our cameraman and understanding, you know, what he needs to do to capture it. But uh, for people that are going on these adventures, it's it's a lot of a lot of hunters reach out to me, George, and I'm sure you get it too. And they say, "What should I look for there? Or where should I go? Or what area?" And I always tell them, like, you know what? Until you get out there, you're not really going to know. You just you have to see it for yourself. You have to be willing to put in extra miles and go a little further in oklahoma did we i'm pretty sure we kept track but it was something like close to 10 miles you and i put on each day maybe more was it 12 one day uh, for sure uh, 10 was minimum mm -hmm. i would say uh, you and i walking 10 to 15 miles uh, per day some of those I remember, I think it was the last day when we did have the 24 uh, cubby points. We, I'm pretty sure we left the truck and we never came back. Either that was the day before that, when mm -hmm. um, the one day where I had to pick up, I mean, Tucker, I had to pick Tucker up and walk him a half mile out because he was just, he had already put on, I forget what he put on that day, but. Yeah, 40 was, miles. I want to say he did. If we did 10, 10 to 15 uh, miles, I mean the GPS tracks his every movement, and yeah, we you know <laughs> we got out there. Right. That so that definitely I remember that very well because the dog went on point and we got up there and there was no birds and it was just because he was done. He literally said enough. But we were trying to get him to go back to the truck and the problem was he kept running into coveys and he kept going on point and taking us two, three, four hundred yards out of the way. And as we we're trying to go to the truck to end the hunt, he, he probably locked on like eight more coveys, seven more coveys, something like that. So we were trying to end the hunt and he just kept finding birds. And eventually those plum thickets, uh, they just, they took a toll. If somebody is going to go do that kind of a hunt, it's different terrain. It's a lot different terrain. Uh, Western Oklahoma is very sandy soil. Uh, so walking is actually kind of, uh, it's not firm if I know in that hill country. And those plum thickets are nasty, are nasty. What kind of items did you bring on that trip for your dogs? Well, you always travel with a full uh, full medical kit. Um, but, you know, on that, type of, on that type of ground, you know, you're bringing products that can uh, mend their feet, mend their paws, some type of tough foot. Uh, I would highly recommend... Uh, there's cactus down there um i don't we might have booted the dogs one time but i'd bring dog boots you're gonna run into cactus in some parts of, of um, kansas and nebraska and certainly in, in oklahoma so dog boots and some way to take care of their feet um some type of ointment um you know some type of spray to uh, every every night to uh or every time you put every time you pick the dog back up and put them back on the rig, you're gonna want to check them over and make sure there aren't any stickers in their paws and and yeah. uh, spray their feet down and and take care of them. But <clears throat> yeah, that that hunt, you know, I should caution everybody. I don't want anyone to think that I had to run my dogs down to that point. We tried to turn Tucker, I don't know how many times, and that dog has a big heart. And yeah. he's like, you guys, there's just so many birds up here. I can't <laughs> turn. 
And even when I did, remember when I picked him up, we were heading back to the truck. And we, like you said, we tried multiple times to get back um, to get Boone off the rig. And he just kept finding more birds. And when I did pick him up and physically carried him, and you had to carry my gun, I put him over my shoulders and carried him. Yep. We just sent him back down on the ground. And that dog looked at me and it was, well, there's more birds here. And you know, I think on the way back to the truck, just on the road, he found four more cubbies. Oh, it was he unbelievable. Got, it's I, un- I think I put him on a lead and said, you can't do this anymore, buddy. You will, there's another day. <laughs> we can hunt We can hunt this afternoon. We can hunt tomorrow. We got to get Boone off mm-hmm. the truck and whatnot. And that, you know, that when you're hunting big open area like that, that's the other thing, you know, multiple dog. It's a multiple dog scenario. I'm not mm-hmm. just going to discourage someone that only has one dog to go on these adventures just be aware of your dog's um um athleticism how much time you put in before you took the dog on this trip mm-hmm. my dogs work my dogs get worked every day and people say every day come on george I, every day my dogs get worked some form or fashion and i have you know i I have a dog training facility here at my farm that I train my dogs at. So it happens every day. They have space and the ability to get out and run. So condition your dog before you go on one of these adventures. So you're ready. So when you're in day two and a half, you look over your dog and the dog's in the dog box going, I'm not, I can't do it anymore. I mean, that's how, right. That's, I think day three, you and I were like, if we had a fourth day here, it would have been rough on us. I was worried that I would be carrying you over my shoulders on the way out of there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, and on top of the conditioning for your dog, um, you really got to work on conditioning for yourself, too. Uh, it's it's pretty strenuous up and down. And, um, you know, I really, the last couple of years, I've been putting in some time in the gym, working out. And, you know, I'm, I'm still young, but I can tell that I need, I need to stay in shape to go on some of these adventures. So it's certainly, um, it makes a lot of sense if you're going to put in the time, the resources to go on these adventures and they don't have to be expensive adventures. You don't have to purchase, you know, go through an outfitter to do this. It's not thousands and thousands of dollars. You can do these type, these kind of hunts relatively cheap, but you really want to invest in, you know, Maybe you get out walking. Maybe you get do a little bit of running. You work out a little bit for a few months leading into the hunting season, so you're ready to go. And you're going to really enjoy the hunt a lot more. You're going to be able to push yourself into going into some of these places that a lot of other hunters don't go. The locals, they most likely are going to just take the easy route is what I've learned over the, the last 20 years of hunting. The locals seem to know the easy ones, but the, the hard-to-reach places are are uh, are worth the time to get to George there's so many more places that we got to go uh this ah man I I could talk for hours with you about this so we got to come back let's do another another uh part two of this show okay um but we'll, we'll talk Wyoming sage grouse we'll talk chucker hunting we'll talk prairie chickens in the Dakotas there's there's so much more that you and I have to dig into we're just we're running late or we're we're taking up a lot of time and i'm babbling now i don't want to do that but one thing for people right now what are you doing with your dogs right now this this spring season that we're in a lot of people are at home what can they do well um one thing that you can do with your dog and do it every day is keep keep discipline up Every time, whether the dog's in the house with you or the dog is in a kennel, and I'm, you know, how, however you take care of your dog, when you open the door to let the dog out, make sure the dog waits for you. Don't, don't, don't lose the disciplinary act, you know, the discipline that you have on your dog, the manners that you require from your dog translates to how that dog handles in the field. If you're sloppy at home, the dog's going to be sloppy in the dog training field. The dog's going to be sloppy when you get out to actually go hunting. So every day I'm in my routine. Every time I let the dogs out of the kennel, I open the kennel door. They got to wait. It's just it, all these little things add up. So in the off season, try not to let your guard down. Even as simple as letting your dog out. 
when you get your dog outside, go for a walk with a dog. It, you know, you talked about being in shape for your hunt. There's, it's been a long winter. There's no time like the present for all of us to be in shape and get your dog in shape and, and take that dog for lots of walks, uh, running. I mean, I have an exercise regiment here at my place uh, with a roading unit. We get out on the gravel roads out here in southwest Minnesota, and the dogs, uh, we talked about their feet in, in Oklahoma, that running gravel roads and, and getting out in cover instead of just walking in the green grass helps toughen those feet up. So I would say right now, just work on the discipline of your dog and get out for walks with your dog so the dog stays in shape and you stay in shape. There's nothing worse than getting behind the curve and uh, the dog builds up extra weight before the season starts. And once August, you know, once September shows up, that hunting season, but well, once September shows up, hunting season is really here because uh -huh. uh, some of these seasons start earlier. Like in Canada, we're already there second week of, of September, I, something like that. Um, I would, you know, we're past we're past the April uh, deadline of being out on public hunting grounds. So do not go out in the state of Minnesota anyway right now on public grounds. You're not allowed out there for simple reasons as the, as the birds are trying to build their nests and, and uh, produce their young. So you're not allowed to be out there. So find other uh, parks. If you're in the city, you know, get to a park and, and run your dog and just work on different things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Georgie, will you come back for part two of our uh, public land talk? Yeah, absolutely. I could, awesome. uh, like you said, Travis, I could go on and on and on. <laughs> and oh, I've been on adventures. We could sit here for hours. So I appreciate uh, you inviting me on. Yeah, absolutely. I also want to say a couple weeks ago, I disclosed your recipe, um, your world famous recipe on uh, on the podcast that I had uh, with Waltons. And uh, I've heard from some of our listeners that have tried it. They have said it is the best uh, wild uh, upland bird recipe that they have ever tried. Uh, Walton's is even uh, going to put it to one of their um, one of their tests down there. Um, if you haven't listened to that show, it's the Walton's show, and I highly recommend it. I give out George's recipe. I have used that for every single wild bird that I have shot since you gave that to me about five six years ago. And it, from ducks to geese to grouse to pheasants to quail, it is the best. So Georgie, I appreciate you uh, sharing that. You are changing lives every single day, my friend. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. I just made that recipe uh, a week ago for some friends. Really? What, that, are you what are you calling it? I just call it my pheasant roll up. That's all I, I mean, I didn't know any other way to explain it, but I had friends that hadn't had pheasant like ever or in years and two weeks ago I made it. And one of my buddy's wives was like, I would have never guessed this was pheasant. And if you would have told me it was pheasant, I probably wouldn't have eaten it. This is the greatest thing I've ever had. <laughs> so I went, well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's amazing. I've made it for people before too, as like an hors d'oeuvre that don't eat wild game, you know, and they've been over for one of my kids' birthday parties or things like that. And I just set it out there and they take a bite and they're just like, oh, this is incredible. And then I tell them afterwards, I'm like, yeah, it's a sharp tail grouse. Or I'm like, yeah, that was a pheasant. And they're just like, they're kind of dumbfounded. But, or I say, yeah, that was a goose. And they go, you are, no, there's no way. Like it is, it's so good. So it's the pheasant roll up, but again, it's on uh, the Walton's podcast. George, I think we need to maybe, uh, we're going to have to do that recipe in an episode coming up. We will go into detail on it. I also, when we get back, I've got some ideas on our next adventure. So you're going to have to stick around. It's not going to be next week. Next week, um, I have somebody coming on the show from Federal to find out what's happening uh, right now during the COVID crisis. Are they building ammunition? Are you going to have shotgun shells this season? 
uh, some of those important questions that are going to affect every single one of us. So that will be next week. George, thank you so much, buddy. We'll talk again very soon. Sounds great, Travis. Take care. Thank you. You too. We'll catch you next time on the next episode of the Flush Podcast.